Welcome to Paleo Talks, episode 30. This week, we are with Dr. Stephen Wallace, aka Wally, who is a professor in the Department of Geosciences, and he is also a curator out at the Gray Fossil Site, and he oversees the excavations as director of the field operations. So happy to see you, Wally, and have you on the show again. Thank you. Um, I guess, uh, you know, today's topic is obviously going to be um, going to be tapers, and I, I feel like, you know, if there's one thing that anyone can take home from this talk is just that the Gray Fossil Site is loaded with tapers. And you're going to give us all kinds of cool facts. I'm going to give a handful of cool facts. We'll just see how many, um, how many I get to, depending on the time. And then I have some, you know, some slides at the end in case people ask questions. Um, and some of these are just more fun facts than anything, but you know, why not? So should I go ahead and share my screen? Let, uh, let David go ahead and tell everybody sort of oh, the sure. protocols of the show and you can move over to your screen as well, Wally. All right. Sure thing. Yep. The, the general information about the, the format of the show, same as usual. We're going to have our guest go through the presentation, tell us some cool facts about tapers, and then about 30 minutes in, about halfway in, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So when it comes time to for questions, we're going to ask people to leave their questions in the comments of the Facebook video. And as usual, if for any reason you can't leave a comment on Facebook, you can try other social media uh, platforms. We are Gray Fossil Site on Twitter and Instagram. You can try sending us a comment or message there. I'll be keeping an eye on those as well. And the second half or so of the program will be you know, uh, determined by what questions we're getting from the audience for our guest. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, again, welcome to Paleo Talks, everybody. We come to you from the Center of Excellence in Paleontology at East Tennessee State University, which oversees the Gray Fossil Site, a five million year old site that we have out at Gray. And of course, Wally was the first paleontologist that came to ETSU to really start studying these fossils. And so he has more stories than anybody uh, about this fossil site. And today we're happy to talk with him about one of his research areas, and that is the tapers. So Wally, if you'll take it away. Yeah, and I think um, if it's all right, I'm going to go ahead and pull the little thumbnails off. Um, I'm sure you guys will be fine with that. You don't need to see my expressions necessarily. Um, I can always decide to put them back on if I want. Uh, but anyway, um, basically, <sighs> You know, I've been here since uh, 2001 and, you know, from day one, it has just been taper, taper, taper. And so that's sort of the running joke out there is that if, um, you know, if you're digging out at the fossil side and you find a bone, um, you know, just you know, give a shout and one of us will yell taper because 99 times out of 100, that's probably what you found. <laughs> but obviously, if we're going to talk about tapers, you know, I can't help but uh, at least discuss a little bit about them as far as what they are and kind of where they fit. And if you're not familiar with these guys, they're absolutely adorable. Uh, they look kind of like a, I don't know, a cuddly version of a pig to me at least, but they're actually more closely related to rhinos um, and horses. Uh, they basically are what we call ungulates, which are hooved mammals. Uh, they fall within a group Perissodactyla, uh, which are typically called the the odd-toed um, ungulates. But you know we'll get into that later. Uh, but again, they're closer to horses and rhinos. And today there are four living species. Uh, Tapirus pinchaque is the woolly mountain taper. Um, I love this illustration because they all look happy. I, I don't know if tapers <laughs> are always happy, but they seem to be happy to me when I see them. So I, I, I kind of like this picture. Um, and then you of course have. Uh, terrestris, which is the lowland taper, uh, bared eye, which is the bear's taper, and then indicus, which is the Malayan taper. And these are approximately to scale. They're not perfect because it is kind of cartoony, but it gives you a rough idea uh, that the woolly mountain taper, taper spinchakwe, is the smallest of them. And then the Malayan taper is the really big one. And to give you an idea in terms of mass, you know, the woolly mountain taper, you're looking at about uh, 300 pounds, probably maximum. Whereas the Malayan taper, you can get six or 700 pounds. So they can be pretty good sized animals. And as you can see from this illustration, and then of course, from you know, the pictures that I've, I've taken uh, at the Nashville Zoo, the, the juveniles are actually cryptic, uh, which means they're camouflaged, which is pretty cool. And this particular individual is Cusco. Um, I've kind of developed a relationship at the Nashville Zoo and have gone several times to take pictures and interact with their individuals. And in particular, um, as they, 
you know, as they grow, I love to kind of keep track of them. And uh, this is actually Tybalt, which is uh, another one of uh, Juju's uh, um, offspring. And he's sort of a sub-adult. Uh, you can see hints of his spots, his camouflage here, but he's pretty much losing it. But I like to these pictures because it gives you an idea of scale, just, you know, again, how big these animals really are. And, you know, this is not a normal thing uh, that the zookeepers actually went out to kind of interact with the tapers a little bit uh, to allow us to get some pretty good pictures. And uh, they were really, you know, um, oh, really nice and you know worked with us uh, so that we could get a bunch of really good pictures and see them interacting and see them using their proboscis their little trunk because you know you will notice these guys have a little bit of a trunk here and really when you look at their overall skeleton um, tapers are a pretty conservative animal in terms of their skeleton but it's the skulls where you really see the modifications and it's because of that that trunk that proboscis that they have and this is terrestrial um, which is again sort of the uh, Brazilian or the lowland taper, uh, both typical common names used. And you can see the skull is pretty distinctive looking with this sort of uh, projecting backwards of uh, the whole front of the skull. And then um, this is Baird eye. And again, you see that the skeleton is very, very similar to um, terrestrial or any of the other tapers, but the skull is different. And so that's really where you see the, the, the modifications in these guys. And so sometimes you'll hear them referred to as, quote, living fossils. I don't think that's really a good thing to call them. That They really do have a very modified skull. and They do have a very derived trunk, but the skeleton itself is at least conservative. And I think that's a better term is to say conservative rather than to say that they're, you know, quote, living fossils. Well, Wally, when we talk about that, uh, because a lot of people do refer to them as, as living fossils, their overall morphology, though, really does stay somewhat consistent over time. So how yes. far back in time could you go and basically see something that looks like a tapir? What's really funny is you can go all the way back to the Eocene and you can find these. So we're talking 50, 55 million yeah. years ago. Yeah, and, and they, they're smaller. They're quite a bit smaller at that time, uh, but they basically have the same body plan. And in fact, if you go back to the Eocene and you look at early horses or early rhinos or early brontotheres, they all have a very similar body plan. They were small. They kind of have this general shape. Um, the, where you would see the differences is the teeth and in the skull look a little different. But I will highlight that this trunk is really what's changed. If you were to look at those Eocene tapers, they don't have this, the, the evidence of a trunk. They have a skull that looks a lot like the fossil rhinos at the time, looks a lot like the fossil horses at the time. Uh, you know, the nasals come all the way out like normal, it looks like a normal mammal skull. Um, but as you move through time, the whole front of the skull just basically, they call it telescoping. It telescopes back and it pushes the brain case back and it creates this whole area for the trunk. And so that's really the big modification. So calling them living fossils, you know, like I said, I think it, it doesn't really do them justice because they do have a very modified, you know, skull and they do have this really neat proboscis, but their body is very conservative. So yeah, I mean, if you were to go back to the Eocene, they would look the same, they'd just be tiny. Mm -hmm. Well, it is conservative, but they lasted so long that in another way to look at it is to say, whatever they're doing, they were, it worked. Yes, exactly. And in fact, um, Richard Holbert always used to comment on that is that people call them living fossils or, or claim that they're quote basal, but they have survived a lot of extinction events. You know, they are still here. And, you know, the living species are either endangered or threatened, but at the same time, that's anthropogenic. You know, it's recent. They, they have survived a long, through a lot of extinction events. I mean, even the Pleistocene extinctions, which took out many large mammals, um, spared the tapers, at least in South and Central America. Yeah, that's right. People don't Asia. realize that when we talk about the North American Pleistocene extinction, that tapers were right here. Yeah, they're actually really common uh, in the fossil record uh, in North America, uh, at Europe as well, in Asia. Um, what's really kind of neat is, you know, you probably remember um, being in a cave. Was that um, was that Big Spring or was it the cave above where we? It was the Hickory Tree. Hickory we called tree, it Big that's Spring right. at the time, yeah. but it was Hickory We thought tree. it was Big Spring. That's right. Yeah. But I remember being there with, I think it was me, you, and Brian. And Brian's yeah. like, is, is this a taper tooth? And, and sure enough, it was, you know, it was right, right. on the surface. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're out there. And uh, my other favorite is, um, uh, if you remember, was it uh, Poplar Creek Stream Cave? Yep. Another. Um, yeah, another one of those where they, they said they had some fossils. And so many times when people tell us they have fossils from a cave, you know, you go to look at them and they're, they're nothing, they're rocks or they're weird things, but, but they had beautiful fossils, including a maxilla that had taper teeth and it was gorgeous. 
And I just remember the first thing I thought was, you know, they were, of course, gigantic, but we'll get to that. In a <laughs> right. So, of course, you know, we have to talk about our little guy. And, you know, the reason I say little guy is because uh, when Tapiris polkensis was first described back in 1960, uh, what they had was a single tooth uh, and uh, which they labeled as the holotype, which is basically considered, you know, the, the, the type specimen that you always go back to. Uh, that defines the animal, and then a pair type, which was a jaw. And these were from Polk County, Florida, hence the name Polkensis. And that was really all we had. And when we started, you know, working at, at the Gray Fossil Site, uh, we basically very quickly realized it was the same animal, but that we had lots of them, you know, lots of skeletons, lots of, of skulls. And I mean, just I, I, my, one of my favorite stories with skulls is talking to a fellow paleontologist, Russ Graham, at a conference one time, and he said, so Wally, what cool things did you find at Gray this year? And I said, um, eh, we didn't really find a whole lot. We just found a few taper skulls. And he just lit up and was like, a couple of skulls. And, you know, he was so, you know, upset that, that I just blew it off, like, eh, just some taper skulls. He's, I'd do anything for some taper skulls. And <laughs> Because, that's because you know, he had tried to work with Pleistocene ones and there just aren't hardly any. Yeah, they're, they're just not real common. And that's probably something I, I should highlight is that the Gray Fossil Site is the largest fossil taper site on Earth. I mean, there's really no other site that has as many tapers as we do. And we even, you know, at, an, at another conference, we were talking about our skulls once and it, it dawned on several paleontologists in the audience that we have more fossil skulls than like some place like the Smithsonian has modern skulls. And so that, that's unheard of in, in, in paleontology to have more of a fossil taxon than there exists of living you know, uh, forms. So, you know, it really is kind of a unique th site. I mean, in the fact that we have so many tapers, but it, it's also given us uh, insight into taper life and, and how they, you know, the variation that's normal and it's allowing us to learn quite a bit about these little guys. And, one of the first things, you know, of course, is that we did learn is that, yeah, it's not just the teeth that are small, the whole animal is small. And if you go out to the museum, you know, you'll see these skeletons and you'll think, wow, you know, those look like pretty good sized animals. But again, if you do the whole scale thing and you look at the living uh, tapers today and throw ours in, um, it is actually pretty small. It's just a little bit smaller than the woolly mountain taper. And in fact, um, when we were, were creating these mounts, these original skeletons, uh, when we were trying to articulate our first uh, mount. We didn't have all the parts that we needed ready. We had them, they just weren't ready yet. And so we filled in using a few a few pieces from a woolly mountain taper. I think the ribs and the vertebrae come from a uh, woolly mountain taper. And it was just something that, you know, at the time it was the simplest, quickest thing for us to do was uh, an equivalent size taper because again, the body is pretty conservative. Since that time, we've prepped out the ribs and vertebrae from the original skeleton that we used for all the other parts. And um, I guess at some time, at some point we could always replace it out. But ours really is unusual. Um, don't try to read into this. This is just a kind of a, a family tree, um, or I shouldn't say a family tree. It's a tree of all the, uh, modern quote tapers and fossil tapers that are within the genus Tapirus. But the thing to note is just look at the colors. The blue colors are big species and then the green and sort of the green colors are medium size and then these sort of hot colors are the really tiny ones. And what you can see is that you know with within its relatives or close relatives, Polkensis really is tiny. And that's why we call it a dwarf taper, because it really is tiny. It's nested nicely within a bunch of these other species of the genus Tapirus, but it's tiny compared to them. Um, but you could also notice uh, that, you know, Indicus, which is one of the living ones, is huge. It's really big, and it it's, has a lot of big relatives. So it looks like size is something that kind of goes with, you know, who you're related to, and that you have these occasional oddballs, like Hazi being fairly large, Polkensis being fairly small. So Wally, what about that T. Augustus? How large is it? Uh, there's a couple of really big fossil ones out there. Uh, the T. Augustus is also sometimes called Megatapirus. And it's that really giant one that's in uh, Asia, that's in China, basically. And I've seen skulls of it. And it's, it's big, but it's not, you know, you read about it in the literature and they'll say it's as big as a small rhino, but they must mean a really small rhino. Because okay. when I looked at the skulls, when we, when we were in China, we saw skulls mm -hmm. and they weren't, um, they weren't as big as even our teleoceros. So it's definitely a big taper, don't get me wrong, which you're probably looking at a thousand or 1200 pound animal. 
which is, I mean, that's big. Don't get me wrong. That's a really big taper. Uh, just not quite as, it's not a small rhino, at least not in my book. <laughs> right. But, but anyway, um, let's see. Uh, oh, and I guess I should have pointed out the little crosses are the extinct ones. So this is kind of a neat tree. But, you know, it is neat to see that ours really is this unusual, you know, tiny taper. And that's, again, why we call it the dwarf taper. Because I've often had people ask me, why do you call it a dwarf taper? And what we're just trying to say is that it is a small species is really what we're trying to say. Um, it's not some abnormality. It's not a, a mutation. It's just a species that's genuinely small. Now, as far as the reconstructions, you know, I always have people ask me, where did we get these reconstructions? And um, Karen Carr was the artist that did our original reconstructions. Uh, I think at the time, I, I mean, I knew of Mauricio, but I didn't, you know, I was brand new when I was hired and we, you know, we got some money to work on this and I, it was just, who can we get quickly? And I, you know, in retrospect, I, I, nothing wrong with Karen Carr, but I would have loved to have had Mauricio work on these too. And in fact, I think that's something we'd like to have him do is do some updated reconstructions. Uh, but anyway, you ask, where did we, you know, where did we come up with the ideas for this? Where do we get our patterns? And really, um, it is based on that tree in the sense that the closest thing to Polkensis that's alive is Baird Eye. And fortunately for us, that's the species that they have at the Nashville Zoo. And so, you know, it is something that we can get good photographs of and, um, you know, we can actually get a really good, use it as a really good template because it is closely related. Um, and so it's kind of a nice starting point. It doesn't mean that it's perfect. It doesn't mean that, you know, our tapers weren't green with purple polka dots but at least it's a good starting point. And Karen did a lot of early sketches. I uh, had a lot of fun working with her. Um, she, of course, had a lot of fun making the sketches. <laughs> I um, remember that. <laughs> yeah. So, and, 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 you know, of course, a lot of these, you know, we didn't use all of them. I mean, she was constantly doing updates and, you know, sending me things and we would kind of go through and some of them got used and some of them didn't. And even some, you could kind of watch through their various iterations because, uh, she does all of her painting in the computer, which is, I think, is pretty standard now, but at the time it was sort of a newer thing is to do it all in the computer. And so she would do a, a simple sketch like this, but then all the painting took place in the computer. And so you'd see these versions, these iterations where you have, you know, sort of a draft, and then she starts to add in detail and then eventually a larger context. And so it was still a lot of fun. I mean, there's definitely things I would change, you know, how that works. I mean, mm -hmm. anytime you have art done, you always look at it after the fact and think, eh, I probably would have done this or I probably would have done that. I mean, my big thing right now is her, her, her baby tapers look like they're about half the size of what they should be. They should right. be a little bigger than this, <laughs> um, but it's, it's still adorable and it's still cute. They just, they're a little too small, um, but that's okay. You know, we can tolerate that. It just makes them look more adorable. <laughs> And of course, you know, she tried to sneak them in wherever she could, you know, so here you've got tapers in the background with, you know, peccaries or alligator, um, even our panda hiding up here in the trees. Um, Sean would be pleased because there's turtles down here in the water. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it, it was fun. It was fun to be able to do these reconstructions. And, you know, again, basically bring the tapers to life rather than having just these stagnant skeletons. And it's unfortunate that a lot of these didn't get you know, used necessarily in the paintings, but they were used throughout the exhibit. If you walk through the exhibit, you'll see a lot of these little sketches tossed in here or there. And so I, I try to use them when I can, but um, it's, it would have been nice if more of these had been in the exhibit itself. Of course, you know, I said I would, I wanted to tell stories. I can't, I can't talk about tapers without talking about the snaper. Um, this is one of those where people always ask me, um, why do you call it the snaper? because it just seems like the most bizarre thing. And for those of you that aren't familiar with this story, um, when paleontologists are digging in the field, we can't help come up with nicknames for specimens. We just can't help it. You know, you're out there digging and, and you, you, know, you run into something weird. I'll go ahead and stick our little faces back on here. You run into something weird and you know, somebody just jokingly throws out a nickname and it sticks and it happens all the time. And the snaper is a classic one. And at the time it was found, this was our most complete taper skeleton. It's the one that almost all the mounds in the museum are based on. And um, it was also one of our oldest individuals. But why do we call it the snaper? And so, of course, you know, I can give you guys a little heads up. And the story starts off actually with a rhino that we were excavating. And what you're seeing in this picture is in the background is most of a rhino skeleton. And this is a rhino skull. And while we were jacketing this skull, we ran into 
uh, some taper legs. These are hind legs. And in fact, here I kind of labeled everything real fast. And as we, you know, you can see the jacket even here in the corner kind of hinting um, in this picture. Uh, while we were jacketing that rhino skull, we had to get these legs out of the way because of course, you know, you're gonna roll them, roll the jacket over. You don't wanna crush these little legs. So we ended up having to do a separate little mini jacket and get out this these taper legs. But of course, you'll notice that now that we've made this jacket or this or started to make a jacket for the legs, you can see the pelvis over here. You're seeing other bones show up. Well, you know how it works. I mean, this is par for the course at any site, let alone gray, is that as you get things out of the way, you just find more things. And so, of course, once we got the hind legs out, we ran eventually ran into the front legs. Uh, by this time, we had pulled out the rhino jacket. This green pad is sitting where the skull of the rhino was and where the hind legs um, were. And so now we're looking at front legs. So you can kind of see in relatively the hind legs would have been here. Here's the, the rhino skull, then here are the front legs. Again, these are all, I guess I should have stressed this, but these legs are taper legs. And, you know, of course we had to remove those. And what we were left with was literally this taper pelvis you can see up here and I'll show you a better picture in a second and then this string of vertebrae in a straight line and in the field again we start joking around and we're looking at this pelvis how it's swept back and kind of comes to a point and then this string of vertebrae and people kept saying it looks like a giant snake you know and so very quickly it became the snaper because it was a snake taper and the skull is actually up here we hadn't quite hit it yet at the time and we eventually did hit it and so this ended up being one of our most complete skeletons uh, this section of clay here actually had a whole series of ribs in it so it's a beautiful skeleton with all you know all four limbs the skull the pelvis the whole works uh, but hence the name the snaper and so you know people always joke around why do you call it the snaper well now you guys know now we need to find a snake that large at the gray fossil site. I would think that'd be <laughs> awesome if we find a snake that large. Um, and of course, you know, you always get added bonuses. And even this, you can see the, the pelvis here it being sort of a separate little jacket. And when we opened up this jacket, um, we got some fun bonuses. Um, we actually, what I'm highlighting here, these are um, the husks from hickory nuts. If you've ever seen a, a hickory nut when it's first forming on a tree, it has kind of a leathery husk. And so clearly these guys were eating at least the husks. Um, they apparently weren't being fully digested. They were going through the animal. And if I recall, um, I think Sean would have to, to remind me, but if I recall, I wanna say that we found over 15. It was like, it was like 15 or 16 of these husks in basically the, the um, abdominal cavity which is pretty cool to think that, you know, basically they, this animal was eating them because we do occasionally find them in the clay, but they were really concentrated. So, you know, you can make the argument that here they are in the pelvis, in the gut cavity. So essentially we were digging through poo, which is always fun, right? <laughs> but it all, again, the, the nuts shouldn't be that surprising when, um, uh, uh, when McLaren was looking at the limb bones, he went ahead and did a quick summary chart of all the different isotopic work that's been done, including uh, Larissa's work that she's done on Polkensis, which is our little guy here. And the big takeaway from this is you're looking at um, more open environments, and then as you go to the right here, more forested environments. And you know, when you look at where Polkensis and a lot of these fossil ones sit, you know, they are in basically a, a forested environment. They're not as dense a forest as a lot of the living species. Because again, notice that if it doesn't have a cross, it's a living species, um, but it is a, a forest. And this comes back to your question that you asked me before, Blaine, is I'm wondering if perhaps this dense forest is a recent thing, but forest habitats in general have been a, a, a sort of a common thing for tapers. I think that the density should be looked at though, because I mean, um, you know, maybe this is more of an open savanna slash, you know, not as dense a forest as today. They're in tropical forests, but maybe in the past they had a little more flexibility. Still forest, but not quite as dense. And, you know, I, I know I, I had to sneak these in uh, because, again, if we're going to talk um, interesting stories and interesting fun with the um, the fossils that we found. There's a lot of weird things that we're finding with our skeletons because we have so many. And I had to sneak this slide in because these are the feet of a living taper. Well, it's not living at the time, but of a you know extant taper. This is a Baird's taper and they did a, a footprint. And so they put red 
uh, dye on the forefoot and blue on the hind foot and they, they did little footprints. And this is why the whole even toed odd toed thing doesn't work so well for uh, tapers because they have four toes on the front and they have three toes on the back. And notice each one of them has its own little hoof and then the pad here in the middle. Um, but what's interesting is when you look at the hind feet of, of modern tapers, they have a weird uh, setup. And don't worry about the details here. The important thing to think of is when you think of, I know I'm talking about a foot, but when you think of your hand, you know, you have these bones in your hand and we call these metacarpals and in your foot, they're metatarsals. Well, what's cool about tapers is they have this weird vestigial first metatarsal that instead of articulating or touching the second one, like in a normal mammal, it wraps around the back of the foot and tucks in behind and articulates with the third and in some cases the fourth. And people use this as a character a lot of times to distinguish the different species of taper. And they'll say, does it have just the third articulation or does it have the third and the fourth? In this illustration, you have both. And what's cool with gray is we have specimens like this guy, which is, or let me rephrase that, this gal, uh, this female is, a, here we've got a pelvis and, and hind legs that are semi-articulated. The reason I say gal is because there's a fetus mixed in here. But when we looked at her hind feet, she had both conditions. On one side, I've reversed it just so you can see it. On one side, she has the third and the fourth articulation. On the other side, she only has the third articulation. And so this is kind of one of these fun characters that we used to think was important. But here we have, you know, a fossil from our site, a single individual that has both characters. And so it's, I think it's the benefit of having this big sample, so many individuals that we can see this really cool variation. What this means, ah, we're still playing with this. I had a student work on it years ago and um, he didn't really come to a good conclusion. So I think it's a project that I'm gonna come back to. So I need to sell this to some future grad students. Let's work on this again. I thought I had an undergrad that was gonna work on it and then he got sidetracked working on archeology. span So that happens. I'll forgive him for that. Yeah, it's also a good reminder just of how variation can end up, you know, being one species and not necessarily two different species. Sure, because uh, this character was used when um, people would create their trees, they would say to which condition does it have? Does it have the one on the right or does it have the one on the left? And they would use that as a character. And here we have a single individual, not even a species, but an individual that has both characters. So it, it clearly is not as important as we originally thought, but what does it mean? It has to mean something. And so that'll be a fun one. And it's, again, it's not just the feet, you know, we've got lots and lots of skulls and jaws from the site uh, where we can see all kinds of um, uh, cool variation, everything from, you know, differences in uh, robustness to differences in um, you know, the number of lacrimal foramina, which is the openings here in the lacrimal. Um, again, a character that was typically used as diagnostic. Uh, we have specimens that have one, and we've got a picture of one here with two. We even have some individuals that have three. And so clearly it's, it's not as important as we originally thought. Um, you know, differences in the, the, the way the uh, frontals and the nasals sort of interact with each other, all kinds of fun stuff. Even uh, development of the sagittal crest you know, has varied tremendously. And here we have the tops of skulls. So it, it, it's really been fun to work on the tapers, but at the same time, it's complicated because there's just so much, you know, there's so much variation that we're, you know, we're running into. And I feel like there's this infinite supply of questions. And, Holly, do you think that there's any ahead. change in the variation over time? Like there are certain times where you have population look like this, and then at a different time, they're looking more like this. I definitely think that's a possibility. And I think that's uh, the importance of us um, surveying and keeping track of all of this throughout the site, because I, I think you're probably exactly right, is that we probably have um, some you know, time averaging in the sample that we have in the museum that might represent you know, 10,000 years worth of deposition or something, or even if it's only a few thousand years, you could have different populations of the same species moving into the area. And so, characteristics that would probably be consistent within a population are different between populations. And so, yeah, I think that's probably what's going on. And this sagittal crest development, you know, that's something that um, Matt Bushell is working or looking at the sagittal crest development right now. And that's something that we've talked about is that, you know, perhaps this is just a time thing that you have. If we could 
map it through depth at the site, could you see that maybe deeper ones have a different configuration than shallow ones or, or something along those lines? And we just need to keep track of it. And part of that has to do with numbers. You know, right now, if we were to separate them based on depth, you know, you wouldn't have an, have dozens of individuals at each, each depth. You'd probably have just one or two. So it's harder to see a pattern. But sooner or later, as we keep collecting, you know, 100 years from now, when we have 10,000 <laughs> tapers, right? Yeah, whenever we're 150, right? Yeah, I was I was like to joke around, you know, when my when I'm a robot with a jar on top with my head in the jar, that's that's when this will happen. Um, I think my favorite illustration along those lines was the one that Mick did. When um, for those of you out there that aren't familiar with this, uh, uh, Mick Whitelaw is a geologist and the professor in our department, and he came out and did a uh, him and his, his uh, wife did some surveys, uh, some gravity surveys to look at the shape of. Uh, basically the basin that that holds our fossil site and based on the, the the shape of it and the volume he then looked at how much have you actually dug and how long have you been digging and based you know sort of do, let's do the math let's do the calculations how long will it take you to dig out the whole deposit and I think his estimate was wasn't it like 16,000 years or something ridiculous and so yes. he he had 16, this thing six hundred or something. <laughs> he had this picture of a lawn chair next to one of the pits with a skeleton in it. And I think he even painted a beard on it or something and said that was me. <laughs> and it was just it was pretty funny because it was, you know, I mean, we, we've, we've just scratched the surface out here. We'll be digging for a long time. And that's a common question we get because people do often think we want to dig the whole thing out. How yeah. long will it take? How long will it take? And it's like, well, you know, it's very unlikely we'll dig the whole thing out. I mean, we'll, we'll continue to do samples, but eventually, you know, you'll reach a point of diminishing returns where you're not finding really anything new. Um, and you want to save it for future generations. You know, a thousand years from now, the technology could be so different. I just want to jump in for a minute and remind sure. people to send their questions to Facebook or other uh, other avenues. David, do you have any comments on that? I can actually say that it was perfect timing. All right. Well, very good. All right. Well, look at that, Wally. You are right on time. Yeah, now is a great time to remind everybody that if you have questions, go ahead and start putting them in uh, the Facebook comments next to the video. And like I said before, if you can't leave a comment on Facebook for any reason, head over to the Gray Fossil site Twitter or Instagram page and I'll be keeping an eye out for questions there. Uh, Blaine, if there's anything that you wanted to say uh, while we wait for questions to come in, we have some from our students, or if you had something you wanted to say, go right ahead. I don't have any right this moment, but uh, right. we do have several from our students. We can jump in with those. Sure, 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 let's go ahead and do that. So this first one's from Christiane, who says, regarding the hickory nuts found with the snaper, have any studies been done uh, on these tapers helping to disperse this this plant? I don't know about hickories specifically, but I do know that they are dispersers, you know, in the jungles today in South America and Central America, they're having studies done where they've looked at the scat and they've looked at the, the seeds that are being transported by these animals. So they are good for that. Um, you know, they don't, their digestion system is not set up to really break down a lot of those hard nuts. And so they will pass them through. So I think that, um, uh, you know, the, the short answer is yes, the, in modern tapers, they are dispersers. Whether ours was doing it, that's a cool question. You know, and I, I think a person could easily make the, um, make the leap to say probably, you know, I mean, I can't see that their digestion would have been that much different. And, you know, I'm sure that when you eat a hickory nut, um, if you break the nut open, you, of course, are going to, you know, you're going to digest the innards. But if you, um, if you're just swallowing the whole thing and you're eating the sort of leathery husk, I wouldn't be surprised if they weren't even just spitting out, you know, the actual nut itself and just eating the soft tissue on the outside. Um, I've was in a local park and picked a couple hickory nuts. And it was, I found it entertaining that, um, uh, you know, there is some thickness there. And, you know, when they're green and before they actually mature, there is some thickness. And so there's a fleshy part that they can eat. And so I'm sure they just sort of chew it up and spit out the, the seed. And I've um, a perfect analogy, uh, and, I'll, and I'll quit, I promise. But perfect analogy is I actually watched a, a couple of white-tailed deer in my backyard eating peaches. And they would pick up the peach and they would roll it around on their mouth for a little while and they would just go and spit out the pit. 
And it was really entertaining because they were clearly just eating the soft tissue and then spitting out that pit. And so tapers, I could see easily doing the same type of thing where they just sort of eat the soft tissue on the outside and then spit out the, the nut. But in the meantime, they could be walking, they could be traveling. And so yes, they're dispersers and anything they do swallow, they're gonna disperse. And then speaking of the tapers diets, Alexis has asked, are there any major differences in the teeth of the gray tapers compared to modern tapers that might suggest different food habits? Not really. Um, taper teeth are really difficult to tell apart. Um, they are, again, like the body, they're very conservative. And so if you were to look at a Eocene taper tooth and a you know, Pleistocene taper tooth, a uh, modern taper tooth, the taper tooth from gray, they look very similar. And so isolated teeth are incredibly difficult to tell apart. There are mild differences, but they are very minor. So it appears as though their diet has been pretty consistent from the beginning, but it makes sense. I mean, during the Eocene, things were much warmer and lusher. And so they, they kind of evolved that lifestyle and they stuck with it. And, you know, one of the things that I always like to say too is when back to the whole living fossil is um, rather than calling them a living fossil, just say that they got, they got good at what they do early. And so they stuck with it. You know, I mean, if it works, keep doing it and they're still here. So obviously they do it well. Um, but to answer your original question, no, there's, only, there's very little difference between their teeth and other fossil taper teeth. Let's go with this one from David Carney real quickly here. And then it's gonna lead into a question that I have. Sure. From what I hear, modern taper species are not seen as very gregarious. Does defining such as an abundance of tapers at gray make you think they may have had different social behaviors compared to modern tapers? And I've heard you talk about this before. Yeah, that's the magical question um, is could they have been, you know, hurting or something like that? And there are a couple different approaches. Um, I actually had a, a student. Um, uh, Tom Gatano looked at the brain endocast and was going to see if he could see differences in the way the brain was set up that might suggest behavioral differences. And one of the things that he found was that um, he didn't see any differences, that the, the, the basic proportions, the setup looked the same, suggesting that at least from that perspective, that data suggested that they behaved the same. So they would not have been, quote, hurting. Uh, that doesn't mean that they weren't, that there could have been something else dictating it. Um, but I think really the way to think about it is, um, Tapers today love water. They do everything in water. Um, when the rainforest floods, they don't leave. Um, you know, they poop in water, they eat in water, they mate in water, they do all kinds of, they just love water. And in fact, I've seen tapers at zoos. Um, when we were at Nashville one time, uh, Juju, who's in this picture right now, actually, she was in her, behind the scenes, in her enclosure, and it had a concrete floor, and they just had this, this tub over in the corner that had water. And she walked over and stuck her back legs in the tub, and I thought, what is she doing? And she pooped in the tub, you know, she's got to mm -hmm. do it in water. And it was, it was kind of entertaining. And of course, as a good scientist, I filmed it because I, you know, here we have, you know, behavior. But, um, but I think the way to look at it is that if, if gray was a pond or a lake and it was the only one in the surrounding area, it may simply be that the tapers were coming here because this is their preferred environment. And, you know, if you have a lake or a pond filling in with sediment, that might take, you know, 10, 15,000 years. Well, if only one taper died a year in 10 or 15,000 years, that's a lot of tapers. And so I, I don't know that it's necessarily that we have so many because um, they were all here at the same time, but just that it was their preferred habitat. Because if you look at the other common animals at gray, it's the turtles, the fish, the salamanders, the frogs, you know, it's the other aquatics. And most of the other large mammals per se, or other large vertebrates are rare. You know, they, they, they're passing through. And so I think it may just be that that things like, you know, the saber tooth cat or things like a camel or things like a horse were coming here for because it was a water hole and they were visiting it rarely, whereas the taper, they're probably spending some time there. They liked it. It was their preferred habitat. So they stayed there. And so I think it's just an attritional, you know, there's so many there commonly that we have, we have more. So I don't think it's any, I don't know if it's necessarily a difference in behavior, just um, in terms of herding. I think it's a difference in behavior that they like, they prefer this habitat. Yeah, I, I agree. And you could have multiple ones there even at the same time, but it doesn't sure. mean that their behavior was different. But one of the yeah. things I, this brings to question, and, and maybe we can bring Chris up too if he's still there, but you know, why would tapers even occasionally die in water when they're so used to being in the water? You know, is it that because tapers go to the bottom and run around that they were going down into an anoxic environment? Was it that you know, occasionally you have this lake that's somewhat toxic. 
you know, could there be things like that that could have contributed to their death occasionally? It's definitely possible. I don't see why not. Um, when we look at the age structure, this is something that we've been updating um, because again, Matt, Matt Bushel has been looking at the um, coming up with an updated minimum number of individuals, which for those of you that aren't familiar with that, his current number is 135. And that is just from Gray. That's not even including the stuff at Knoxville, uh, which when Richard and I came up with our estimate of 75 included the stuff at Knoxville. So this is just from Gray. And he, because he's looking at the astragalus and not focusing on skulls, he's getting a lot more juveniles. And when we look at the age distribution, um, it does look like um, just sort of a rapid burial, you know, attritional setting that it's not, not catastrophic, but just that as the animals die, they're getting buried quickly before those juveniles would get eaten up or broken apart like normal. And so you're seeing a distribution of ages that you'd expect high on the young end, sort of low in the middle, and then a little bit towards the old end, um, which is just, it's not a, a, a kill site or, or a, cat, a cat, right. catastrophe. It's, it seems to be an attritional setting uh, when compared to other sites. I mean, one of the things that I wondered, we haven't talked about it on here yet, but what happens when something elephant size dies in a pond like this? What happens to the the water? You know, I've gotta, wondered about that. Yeah, is does it become toxic? You know, for I mean, a while. you know, for at least a short period of time. I mean, I, you think of when we macerate things and we put a carcass in water, how nasty that water gets so quickly, but then also how quickly that dissipates. Yeah, all the tapers come running down. They're excited to get in there, and then it's and not then so, not so good that day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, and 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 it could even be just for you know, I mean, six months or a few right. months. I don't, I don't know yeah. how long it would take, you know, a proposidian carcass laying in a pond like that. I would imagine that it would spoil the water for some period of time, but, but I guess it also depends on whether we're talking about was the original pond, uh, you know, four or five acres or was it 10 acres yeah. and right. how much fresh, you know, how much groundwater was coming in, you know, and, or the occasional stream, you know, flowing in. I mean, I think those all come into play, but I, I don't see any reason why it couldn't have been occasionally toxic. Chris, how would it impact an environment? Yeah, well, I mean, this was something I, a question that I posed to Sarah Keenan, who is a postdoc at the Body Farm a couple of years ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you take a, you know, 10 ton mastodon and put it at the bottom <laughs> of a four and a half acre pond, what is it going to do to that environment? And she said, well, okay, clearly it's going to have some sort of, you know, anoxic effect. You're either going to have, you know, localized anoxia or it's just going to kind of just, just destroy <laughs> these aquatic ecosystems. And then the second, the follow-up question was, well, how long would it take to get back to normal? You know, assuming that you're talking about a closed system mm -hmm. and it was years. <laughs> uh, you know, for the nitrogen to go back down to something normal or the carbon. And again, that would depend on how big it was. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. But well, and I'm, yeah, I'm sure it also depend on flooding events and things like that. Because, uh, you know, when, it, when Aaron Chunk talked about uh, the stream nearby and occasionally flowing in, I know that was late in the history of the pond. So, you know, it could even be too that early on in the history, you know, you didn't get those influxes very much. And so there could have been long periods. And to hear that it's years is, is fascinating because I, I, now I, I, I want to envision this, you know, bloated, nasty <laughs> thing uh -huh. rotting away and then leaving this horrible environment for a short period of time, this little death trap. And, um, or a family of proboscideans. Yeah, yeah. even that. Yeah, I mean. You know, we've I, got the, these problems with toxic algal blooms right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's tethered to, sometimes it's tethered to, you know, anoxic conditions and, and that's sort of high nitrogen. Um, yeah, I was going to say it's that influx of, of um, you know, food in a sense to have, you know, the crazy blooms and the stuff like that. And so, you know, why not? I mean, if you have all of this flesh dumped in there, whether it comes from proboscideans or, you know, a few tapers, you know, a couple of big tapers die or a couple of rhinos die. I mean, this had to have been a, a continuous, you know, it had to be happening pretty regularly, I'd imagine. So we just need a taponomic yeah, study to set up, Chris. I know. A pond with a dead elephant in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've, we've all joked around about this for years. I mean, we uh, of getting a, a, a big pond and then floating some things out in it, letting them rot, and then, you know, do this for two decades and then monitor the, all the, the chemical things, but then dig them up eventually, too. Sounds good. <laughs> so everybody that's out there in the world, if you have one of these in your backyard, let us know. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, we better get back to some of the Facebook yes. questions, David. Sorry about that. Sure thing. Actually, speaking of uh, taphonomy, Greg has asked, are there any alligator bite marks on our taper bones? 
That is something that is so disappointing. There are, I think there are, there's literally, and off the top of my head, I can think of one bone that has a clear alligator bite mark. And, and even then I, I would say that it, I'm not hundred percent certain. It's just, it's a conical puncture, you know, in the bone with the bone compressed and it's in a, a cervical or neck vertebrae. Um, but other than that, uh, very, I mean, we just don't have it. There's, there's very little evidence of scavenging. There's very little evidence of even rodent gnaw marks. Even those are rare at gray. We only have a few bones that have rodent gnaw marks and the ones that we do, um, I know there was a piece of turtle shell that came in that must have sat on the surface because it is heavily gnawed all the way around this little fragment of turtle shell. But that's, you know, off the top of my head, that's the only one I can think of. That yeah, there's really that gnawed. punctured uh, musk turtle. And uh, I oh, remember yeah. Steph Stephanie Drumheller came and looked and, you know, she said, what do you guys have in terms of pathologies? And we said, well, we don't have very many. And then she looked through the whole collection and she's like, yeah, you don't have very many at all. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is, uh, you know, for tapers, uh, that's really all I can think of is that one cervical vertebrae. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but yeah, for, for turtles, I think there's the musk turtle, but then th doesn't our snapper have a yeah. potential bite mark in it too? But again, you, you, here we are listing less than half a dozen. Mm -hmm. and that's all we can think of. I mean, for whatever reason, it just wasn't occurring. And, you know, that, that, that's a whole nother question that people have asked is, were these alligators actually living there and breeding there or were they passing through? And that's, you know, that's kind of beyond the scope of this talk, but it's, um, that could be related to it. All right, we've got another question, a uh, much more taper specific question. Maggie asks, is it known why they have four toes on the front feet and three on the hind feet? Are there any benefits or disadvantages to this morphology? One way to think about it is when you're actually, uh, when you're walking, and you're running or going through the jungle, um, having a little more dexterity on the front feet is really gonna help with steering. Whereas with the hind feet, you're primarily propulsion, you're pushing. And so they have sort of big feet in the back for pushing, and then the front feet have the extra, you know, the extra digit for the steering and the manipulation and you know, um, being able to um, navigate you know, complicated terrains. Um, uh, but it's also too, you know, they're spreading out too. They can spread out on soft terrains as well. Think of it that way too. So, you know, be, because they're going to be eating and they're going to be reaching and pushing, they need their front feet to spread out. So it's a combination of those two things. Pigs do that too. Yeah, really spread their toes out. I remember when I was in the uh, Yucatan in Belize, I got to see pecker, or I got to see tapir tracks and they are so unusual if you haven't seen one before. Yeah, they almost look webbed in a sense. Um, yeah, we, um, we made some prints. Um, I've got them around here somewhere, but uh, we, we were able to get a, uh, you know, Romeo was uh, an individual that, that uh, he's actually the father of uh, Cusco that you see here. Uh, Romeo was at the Nashville Zoo and he passed and we were, you know, we obtained uh, Romeo for our collections. And so we took his feet and that's why I had the picture of the, the feet with the, the paint on them is that they, they had taken prints, but then we also decided to create, I um, mean, what they did was on paper, but we decided to create actual footprints. And so what we did is we took, you'll love this, we took Play-Doh. Um, you know, I just bought some cheap Play-Doh and I made a big pad and then I put it on a board and then squished it against his feet and really let them spread out. Uh, and it made fantastic prints. Um, and then we cast those, um, which was nice to be able to have sort of permanent casts of his feet. Um, but they really did. The toes really do sort of spread out when you push on them like that. They clearly are designed to spread out and disperse that weight. Other questions, David? Sure. Uh, speaking of taper anatomy, Ethan has asked, so in reference to the, the telescoping of their skulls, as he puts it, do taper, shows, do taper skulls show overlapping sutures like a dolphin as they evolve that telescoping, or is it more a matter of shrinking the frontal and maxilla and such? Uh, there is some overlapping. Um, it's not as exaggerated as you see in a dolphin. Um, and it's not, um, dolphins tend to be asymmetric, whereas uh, these guys are still symmetric. 
Um, that that's just an echolocation thing though with with dolphins. Um, but it's I think it's because it's not as extreme that you see the overlap in the sutures, but it's not quite as extreme as we just see in dolphins. But a dolphin skull is really telescope back, um, whereas a taper is like halfway back. I feel like a dolphin's all the way back. Uh, but there is um, a shifting of the brain case re related to that. If you look at early tapers, you know you kind of have the the main skull and the brain case is behind it, and because it shoves backwards like that, it's almost like the brain case gets pushed up. Uh, as it telescopes backwards. But uh, there is, yes, overlapping sutures, just not as extreme as the dolphin. All right, we've got a, a couple more student questions. Uh, Kelly has asked, you mentioned that taper pulkensis is referred to as a dwarf taper. What factors do you think made the species small? That's a good question. I'm not really sure what drove this lineage to be tiny, um, because you know when you you know when you when you think about um, uh, you know all of its quote relatives and things like that, uh, you know they're actually decent sized. And why this one lineage decided to become small, I, I'm not really sure what that was. Um, it's it's a good question and something to look at. Uh, I will highlight that it's more than just the adult size. It's also the time it takes to become an adult. When you look at most tapers by about one year old, they're essentially adult size. And in fact, um, uh, Tybalt, the one that I showed a little earlier uh, was, was literally the second time we visited him, he was only about a year old and he weighed 500 pounds, which was more than his mother weighed. And that was at a year. Um, however, when we look at our tapers, and in fact, this is something that I think I have yeah, when we look at our tapers, um, this is a, a, a little figure that Matt Gibson had put together. What we notice is that a lot of the fusion of the bones and a lot of the adult size is delayed. It happens at a much later age. And so it looks like our tapers aren't just dwarf. They also took time to get to that adult size. So there clearly is some sort of selective advantage. I just haven't looked in to see why. So, you know, that that's, that's probably been that probably would be a really neat thesis for somebody to start looking at is what are the possible um, selective advantages to the small size? Because, you know, if it were, if Polkensis were only known from gray, you could maybe start making an argument about restricted environments or something like that, you know, island type scenarios. But it's also been found, you know, the species Polkensis has also been found in Florida, and there are some specimens from Nebraska. So it's a pretty widespread species. So there, there was clearly something else other than just, you know, re reducing, um, um, you know, ecological, whatever requirements or something like that, you know, there was more to it than just that. So I, I don't know the answer. That's, that's the short version. Julian asks, with such a large sample, can we observe any broad patterns in pathologies? Yeah, there's a lot of neat pathologies that we are starting to notice. Um, uh, you know, the development of arthritis is something that we do see in some of the individuals. Uh, the snaper had some really cool uh, arthritic pathologies uh, where you literally had bone on bone interaction and then, you know, flaring of the bone on either side because of that. Um, there are also some interesting um, diseases that are clearly being recorded. We do see some um, pathologies that might occur, like, let's say, on, you know, one manus but not the other of a single individual. And so they're probably either injury related or disease related. And so I think that, um, again, that's a whole nother project for someone to work on is to start looking at, do we see some patterns? Do you have pathologies that are most common in young individuals, pathologies that are most common in older individuals, you know, things like that. I feel like there, are, because of the sample, there are definitely some things that we could start looking at. It's just a matter of someone taking the time to systematically do it. Molly, who do you think would have been the primary predators on tapirs around the gray fossil site? Macaritus? I think Macaritus would have been an, an easy one because these guys would have been pretty small. And when you look at tapirs today, you know, jaguars are one of their big predators. Um, usually when they're smaller, you know, they, they don't necessarily go after adults. And I think that's why a lot of adult tapirs in South and Central America aren't really afraid of people because they're a good size animal. Um, but yes, at our site, I think Macaritus would have been the predator. Obviously, you know, our quote alligators would have definitely been something they wouldn't want to mess with um, because a good size alligator is still gonna, you know, could definitely take down and injure uh, or at least injure a, a taper, especially a juvenile it would be really easy to pick them off. But I think the, in terms of, you know, quote, big predators, definitely Macaritus. Macaritus is a saber tooth cat. And did it have, um, 
a lot of musculature in the front limbs? Uh, oddly, oddly enough, um, Macaritus is really built more like a, a lion. It's really much more of a, a lanky uh, mm -hmm. saber-toothed cat. It's not built like Smilodon. And so it's really not, even though it probably would have been preying on these guys, it's really not built for it. It's not really the best animal for it. Um, but I suspect there's probably other things we just haven't found yet. Would you, you know, want to mess with a mama taper? Me? <laughs> just to give just to give people an idea that they're not just a cute uh, no, all around. No. They they look they look absolutely adorable, but they are a big mammal. Um, they are known to bite, and I, I should have highlighted that even yeah. though, and this comes back to Alexis' question about the the teeth, even though the cheek teeth are very conservative. Uh, they do often have uh, large canines or large caniniform incisors. And they do have upper and lower incisors, kind of like a horse. And so they can take a pretty good bite out of you. And they've been known to do that. Um, I know there was a, a, a keeper years ago that accidentally got their arm bit off by, by mm -hmm. a taper. And because their teeth are pretty blunt, you know, it mashed it up and they couldn't reattach it. Um, even you've told, I mean, you should tell your funny story of, of the person. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's kind of why I was setting the stage sure, sure. for that. Was, no, uh, but that, that's fine. I remember the day when we started, uh, when we got that news clipping about the arm being torn off of a keeper. Yeah. But, but there's, you know, there's a couple of other stories that are out there. And, and one of them is somebody actually going out in the woods to, to go to the bathroom and sort of, you know, squatting down and being bitten by a taper. That was something that one of my past physicians actually told me this story. And this person had to be Sort of helicoptered out of the area because of that. So, so watch where you go. Yes. In, in the night, in the jungle. In the jungle, yeah. I guess they 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 blend in, and and again, they're they're not really afraid of people, so they're going to sit there. And and, and if, but I imagine if you squat over them, they're not going to sit anymore. Um, but yeah, they're they're definitely. It's a big mammal, and yes, they are going to you know defend their young. So I would not want to mess with a mama taper. So I think that you know, Macaritus would be size wise could do it. Um, you know, a big crocodilian, uh, you know, uh, or a big alligator could do it. But I think that for the most part, uh, once they reach adult size, they're probably not going to have a whole lot to, to worry about. It's the juveniles that are going to be the ones that get picked off. All right. Well, thanks to everyone for asking those questions. It's been a lot of fun hearing the answers to them. <laughs> Any other comments, Wally, or questions? Anybody? We can wrap it up. No, I think I'm good. All right. Well, thank you again, Wally. That's That's been yeah. a lot of fun. No problem. All right. We'll see everybody next week on Paleo Talks. Yep.